Okay. Were you guys going to show a video? No, there, no, no video. Okay. Just a good, good. Okay, I am going to be back here in one minute. You can't get rid control. Anyway, we're recording from right now. Oops. We really need a cover sheet. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We are very excited to have you with us today for our presentation on social, iso social isolation. Excuse me, it's Monday morning, avoiding the unintended consequences. We would like to start out by thanking our host, the MLK Center. So thank you very much for allowing us to be with you and bring this education to the community this morning. Also, thank you to our sponsors, the Cleveland Clinic and the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health for being a part of this um, educational series that we're going to be bringing to you on the first Monday of every month at this time, same place. So my name is Karen Montandon. I'm the VP of Operations, and we are Dementia Care Education. We specialize in training and education for both professionals and community members um, to raise the standard of care for those dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia for loved ones and family members. Without any further delay, I would like to go ahead and get us started. We are in webinar format. Please feel free to avail of the Q&A box if you would like to ask any questions or um, make any comments. We'll be attending to those on the way, but this is interactive, so feel free to join us in that fashion, and we will get your questions answered in some natural pauses during the presentation. Our presenter today is the president and founder of Dementia Care Education, Brian Brown. He has a graduate degree in neuroscience and more than 20 years of experience and expertise in the field of Alzheimer's and dementia research and education. He sits on the Executive Leadership Council of the Alzheimer's Association and is a proud board member of the Fellowship for Christian Athletes, as well as a consultant with the Cleveland Clinic. So please help me do a warm virtual welcome for our presenter today, Brian Brown. Brian, if you're ready, let's take it away. Good morning, everybody. It is uh, great to be here with you again. And we have a very important topic that we're talking about today. Um, our Brain Health series has led us to really uncover a lot of the truths about how our brain works and how to keep our brain healthy uh, as we age. And we 
find ourselves right now in the middle of this pandemic, hopefully getting closer to the end of it right now. But there are these unintended consequences of, of what we've seen through this pandemic start to happen, and it affects our brain health and our overall health. And one of those things is what we're going to be talking about today, and that is social isolation. This whole notion of being isolated is kind of like a, a cruel joke, almost. So much so that in order to get past this pandemic, they told us that we have to isolate in place and we have to socially distance from each other, which creates this social isolation. We know through research that social isolation is one of the most harmful things that you can do for your health. So we're going to uncover and unpack that right now. So Healthy People 2020, that is a, a set of standards that's given every decade by the Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC that tell us and give us a snapshot on how we're doing health-wise. And every decade um, in the past, we've done a snapshot. So like Healthy People 1990, Healthy People 2000, Healthy People 2010, we just finished Healthy People 2020, and we're now gathering statistics for Healthy People 2030. So at the end of each decade, we look at what we did really well and what we did really poorly. And it us what we know as the social determinants of health. What is going on? that's either making us healthy or detracting from our health. One of the key social determinants of health that we know through science and research is this notion of social isolation. Social isolation is one of the things that will kill us quickly. And I'll give you some statistics and we'll define that in just a little bit. But through our research, we know that when we are not living in community, no. it has detrimental oh, health yeah. effects for all of us. So we are creating a community, and when we're absent from that community, we start to see our health Yeah. So let's start to define um, what social isolation is. Social isolation is defined as a yeah, low quality uh, and quantity of contact with others. Uh, it really brings us to when we have few or no social contacts and our social roles are disrupted and we don't have the mutually rewarding relationships that we typically have. It leads to everything from emotional distress, loneliness, poor health, and a host of other negative effects. So that's not the control and just the fact that when we start to isolate you, it starts to change the way that we live. Now, again, the cruel joke is in order to get to the pandemic, that's what we're called to do. But it has had such a profound and negative influence that we need to come up with solutions so that we can withstand what we're going through right now. We're going to talk about some of those solutions towards the end of the lecture. I guess, as Karen said at the beginning of the lecture, if you have any questions, please feel free to put, free to put them in the Q&A box and I'll take a second pause and we'll address any questions that you have along the way. So, social isolation, low quality and quantity of contacts with others. So, we know that we're, we have this engagement that we typically have with others. But social isolation is not loneliness. Those are two separate constructs. Social isolation can cause loneliness, but it is not loneliness. Loneliness is actually a subjective term that each individual responds to their comfort level with their connections. An example of that is you can be in a crowd and be around people all the time and still feel lonely. So loneliness does not depend on the amount of social contacts that you have. It can, but it doesn't always. So you can be in the midst of a lot of companionship and everything like that, but still feel lonely within a relationship or still feel lonely all, all by yourself. Now, we know that loneliness as well, um, social isolation is different because 
loneliness is a distress from my perception of how life should be with my relationships to the reality. So there's a perception that brings on loneliness. So for example, some seniors prefer to be alone, but not experience loneliness. They just are for short terms. They're loners, but they feel perfectly fulfilled being alone. Whereas others, the rest of us, because we are isolated, it will bring social isolation as well as loneliness. So loneliness is oftentimes a byproduct of social isolation, but not necessarily because some people prefer to have less social contacts and still be perfectly fine. So that's the definition of the, of the two. The two are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, social isolation brings across a lot of changes. And so the pathology of social isolation can start with something like the pandemic that we see here, where we're told to isolate in ways that we're socially distant. But there's other things that can bring along social isolation as well. Sickness. We've seen this as people age. They become ill, and they may all of a sudden have to be uh, uh, restricted to uh, being at home or recuperating for a long period of time. So sickness can isolate people from each other. Disability. Have you ever seen some people have um, like all of a sudden bad arthritic conditions that they can't move around a lot or uh, disabilities in terms of the way that they um, that they uh, have uh, limitations in communication and things along those lines, whether it be blindness or, or hearing difficulties, those things can cause social isolation. Or how about life changes? Things like the loss of a spouse, where you never intended to all of a sudden find yourself alone um, because of that. And so it limits the number of social contacts and interactions that you have because of all of these life changes. So nobody starts off by saying, oh, when I turn 78 years old, you know, I want to find myself alone for any particular reason. But it happens because of those things I just said. It just happens because life happens. But it doesn't mean that you have to be socially isolated. We're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. Also, there's other factors that lead people to be socially isolated. Poverty. We know that unfortunately our society is one that um, if you can afford to be a participating member, you can be included in a lot of things. So for example, even things like going out to dinner, um, going to the movies, doing all of those things require fun, money. And when you don't have money, you tend to be more isolated because you can't participate in the richness, richness of things because of finances. So poverty is an isolating factor. Then we have inadequate transportation. In order to get anywhere to accommodate with others, you need transportation. And as seniors age, for example, they oftentimes give up driving and they become dependent on others for public transportation to be able to provide that mechanism of transportation. So when seniors all of a sudden their family lives out of town or something like that, they don't have regular transportation to the things that they like it, and they're not able to get rides and, and public transportation is challenged in many areas of the country, uh, inadequate transportation tends to isolate you also. And all of a sudden these unintended consequences come into play that you find yourself socially isolated. So these are things other than the pandemic that can really put people in a precarious position and find them isolated. So it starts off something that was never meant to be, and you find yourself socially isolated. So we move to there's a difference in family dynamics as well. So we know divorce rates have nearly doubled over the past 40 years. And so we see a lot of single um, adults that, that result from not just the loss of spouse, but by choice of you know, staying divorced. And then we have a number of, of adults who never married, and that's at an all-time high. And then we have uh, the, the U.S. Census tells us that birth rates have plummeted as well. So there's a lot of companies and seniors who are childless who don't have family caregivers or people naturally that would look after them. 
So we find a lot of people as they age are becoming isolated just because of the family dynamics that have changed over a period of time. And then we've seen just changes into the normal family structure. Um, we see things like hybrid families, like LGBTQ seniors. They're more likely to be socially isolated because they're more than twice as likely to, to live alone. And they're less likely to have children, so they don't have the ability to get to have a lot of family around them um, during any given time as they, as, they, as they age. If something happens to their partners, we know that they then can become isolated as well. So the dynamics have completely changed from how they used to be the family structure that we find ourselves very isolated, not by choice. And then when we throw in the pandemic, boom, it really changes how we find ourselves. So how do we navigate through social isolation? And research has given us kind of a roadmap. Either we're going to do it well, or we're going to do it poorly. So we're going to walk through a scientific chart of how we typically cope with isolation. So let's do that right now. So as we find ourselves in isolation, there's something called the isolation continuum. And typically, isolation may be traumatic in short term. So for example, let's say you fell and you broke your hip, right? You know that because we're created to be a community, there's a fight or flight syndrome. I either have to still be able to create community even though that there's this traumatic short-term isolation. And we can even consider um, in, in some cases that the pandemic is a short term. It's not going to last forever, but it's a short term aspect. So we have this choice of having or creating an intervention and then coping with the short term isolation. And some of those um, techniques we're going to discuss a little later, those coping techniques, but we really need to because we know it's going to be for a short term. So we need to do that. Otherwise, it turns into something else. It turns into more of a longer isolation. And this is what we're looking at on the other side, the cumulative long term. And we have a choice to go into what we call the general adaptation syndrome. One is we, we learn resistance and intervention equals coping. And where we are right now, we need to resist this mechanism of being isolated and alone. We need to put some strategies in place so that we can cope overall, even in a longer term setting. So for some people, it's longer term, they lost a spouse, um, they have a medical illness or something like that. So sometimes their isolation is longer term. So they need to resist from falling prey to everything and to cope with what's going on long term. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a while. But if you don't put a coping mechanism in play, and we've, we've seen some of that right now, it's going to equal additional illness that will start to end your life prematurely. That's how serious it is for us to be able to find coping me mechanisms and things that work while we're isolated. Because if we don't, it's going to have negative effects on our health. I want to repeat that. If we don't find coping skills and mechanisms to combat social isolation, it will lead to distress and illness and, and ultimately premature death. That's how serious social isolation is. So let's, let's dig in a little further. The science behind it tells us that our social connections, our ability to connect with each other is so, so important that our risk of death increases by 30% when we are out of our social connectedness, when we find ourselves isolated. We increase our risk for premature death by 30%. And then on top of that, our risk of developing heart disease increases by 29%. And our incidence for, for risk for increasing stroke increases by 32%. So being isolated literally starts a disease process in our bodies that creates this toxicity that can kill us early and bring on diseases early. 
and it's as lethal as smoking 15 cigarettes a day being isolated. That's how much our body depends on our social connections, us being connected. It is dependent so much that we know that smoking is bad for us. Well, so is isolation. 15 cigarettes a day when we find ourselves having no social connectedness. Wow, those are some really, really, really big statistics. But yes, so we find ourselves in that place now where people are struggling, struggling to get through this because everybody is so socially distanced. Then we find ourselves in this situation as well, looking at the symptoms. These are the symptoms that lead to, that we see that start to be displayed when we become socially isolated. We start to feel hopeless. When is this pandemic going to end? Oh my goodness, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, I lost my self worth because I don't have any purpose and I feel helpless. There's nothing I can do. So, hopelessness and helplessness and a lack of purpose all of a sudden starts to drain us. And we lose the interest in things that we once had. We have low energy, we have headaches. We have every part of our drive is diminished because we're not in contact with people. Our social connectedness, which is so important, starts to go away. You've heard me say it in other lectures before, and it's so true now. As the brain goes, the body will follow. So meaning, as we perceive hopelessness, worthlessness, helplessness, we start to lose our interest in things. Our body starts to mimic exactly what our brain says is happening. So it's really important to control our thoughts. And we'll talk about that a little later. But you have to know as the brain goes, the body will follow. So we start to have decreased concentration. We have this diminished memory. This is what we're talking about. Our cognition starts to change. We start to become forgetful. And, and our memory becomes unclear and unsharp. We start to think we're going through a dementia process. And if you are having early on onset of or, or signs and symptoms of dementia, something like this can start to accelerate your dementia because of all of what's going on. There's a change in sleeping patterns. And why is there a change in sleeping patterns? Because every day looks like the last. And so you just basically, it doesn't matter when you get up, when you go to sleep, when you're isolated. And then you have this change in appetite because your days are just looking the same and there's no structure to them because you just find yourself isolated. So a couple of things can happen. You either, because of boredom, continue to eat all day long because it's just something to do and there's food and so you just continue to eat all day long. And so you have weight gain. Or because you're so stressed out, you don't eat, or you forget to eat, and it's just one of those things when you start to lose weight. So there's definitely a change in appetite. Yeah. At Facebook? He's on Zoom. Okay, good.
going to the grocery store and being able to smile at your favorite cashier. Sing and praise and do all those types of things. The person has been taken away from us. We know that just even the simple activities of getting together at the community center and having meals together, getting groceries together, and, and listening to the presentations at the computer club or doing artwork, all have gone along the way. Something makes us really, really sad. So, those are some of the psychological symptoms of social isolation. And then we have the desire to drop out of society, this whole thing of, you know, oh man, nothing matters. And I will just stay as a hermit here because it doesn't matter. And we say, what is it going to end? Am I going to be alone forever? What are things going to get back to a sense of normalcy? And again, those suicidal and morbid thoughts start to creep in because of the lack of control that we have. So as we were, you know, born and created, even when we're youngsters, we all strive for what we call this term called locus of control. This ability for you to control your environment around you. All of us strive for it. From the time we were kids, we tell our parents, we do it, we do it, because we want control of getting dressed. We don't want our parents to dress us. And then we come to a place where we don't want our parents to walk us to school, right? We want to be in control of that. And then when we get our driver's license, guess what? We don't want our parents to have to take us anywhere. We have control over that. We get a job, we say, if I have my money, I have control of how I spend that. So all of our life, we've been striving for what? Control. What has this pandemic taught us? It's taken away our control. And that's why we have all of these symptoms from social isolation, because those relationships that we choose to be in, we don't have control over them anymore. And we start to manifest all of the symptoms that we see. So we move on and we see premature aging happen. Social isolation starts this whole continuum of premature aging. Research has been done, pictures have been shown of people before the pandemic or when the pandemic first started to a year later. And we've seen the aging process accelerate. Aging is a discernible rate. We control our rate of aging. And one of the things that controls our rate of aging is stress. So we've seen that social isolation really change people's physical features. Going more here. gray hair, more wrinkles, yeah. more just yeah. uh, physical yeah. facial yeah. changes yeah. because yeah. of accelerating yeah. aging because yeah. we find ourselves okay. Is that gonna make in noise? such a stressful situation. So how do we find ourselves stressed? Because of this hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is our stress hormone. And when we're stressed out, the cortisol levels raise up and it starts to become toxic for us and it accelerates aging. It accelerates uh, neurotoxicity as well. So we find ourselves battling these high levels of cortisol because we're kind of out of control. We don't have the things that calm us down. So typically, when we're in a stressful situation, we can say, okay, we're home for the stressful situation. But let me tell you, and you guys know as well as I do, this season of COVID has been some of the most stressful our country has ever seen. Not only with the illness and the death, and we have political unrest, we have racial unrest, we had economic strife, we had all sorts of things wrapped up in our social isolation. So our stress levels were sky high. So many of us, on average, aged an additional three years because of social isolation and the pandemic. That's a lot. That's a lot. So social isolation has these physical aspects in terms of our stress response and our accelerated aging. So we need to cope with our stress. Unfortunately, we have turned to some unhealthy coping mechanisms during social isolation. People have self-medicated and turned to drugs. They've turned to alcohol. They've turned to unhealthy eating and nutrition. They've done anything they can just to try and cope, but it's unhealthy coping. And that's where 
we find ourselves with people really struggling as we're coming coming out of, of this COVID era, this isolating era, um, that we find ourselves with these unhealthy habits um, that have led to unhealthy addictions, all because we've been isolated and have lost control of the connectedness that keep us together. We continue to look at what can we do? How can we change the outcomes of what we've seen happen? That's the question that we have. I, I frame up what the issues, but what can we do now to be able to change what has transpired? So we need to turn to research and science to understand how we were, we were created and what we can do is really come out of this on top, knowing that it threatens so much about you know our physicality, our health, our mental well-being. So there's response management. What we can control is how we look at this situation. And there's three major approaches. And science tells us to, to look at situations like this in terms of social isolation. There's an action-oriented approach. There's an emotional oriented approach and there's an acceptance oriented approach. And so finding whichever one works for you so that you can start to adapt. Because as humans, we talk about that general adaptation, adaptation syndrome, we need to adapt. And if we don't adapt, it becomes unhealthy for us. So we have been resilient as human beings. And the more resilient you are, the better your coping mechanisms are. And so how do we adapt? So let's, let's talk about our, our response management, action-oriented. What does that look like? Well, action-oriented looks like confronting the problem which causes your stress. All right, I see you social isolation. I see you. You're keeping me away from all of my friends and my loved ones and my circle and my sphere of influence. I'm going to confront you head on. What small changes can I make to my environment that will potentially change this situation? So what we know about life is that if you plan these big, grandiose changes that you have to make, the likelihood of your ability to make those changes actually diminishes. Because it takes too much energy, it takes too much knowledge, it takes too much every day to make big changes. But in response management, action-oriented, if we make some small changes, just some small changes to our environment, it changes everything. So let me, let me give you an example of a small change. If I decide to sit out on the patio every day for a half hour and just get some fresh air, that changes everything. A lot of us have just been cooped up and holed up and everything like that. But making a small change in the environment by saying, I'm just going to get a half hour of fresh air every day. Believe it or not, those small changes will make a big difference. So look around your environment. Start to think of small changes that you can make on a regular, everyday basis. And again, it's action oriented. So it puts the control back in your hands to make these small changes. You are going to be the initiator of these changes. So that's really important. And when we when we continue along um, this line, we, we start to look at the emotional oriented response. So looking at the emotional oriented response is looking at it this way. We don't have the ability to change a situation, but we can change our interpretation of it how we feel about it. So if we look at the emotional aspect, because we are emotional beings, and our emotions oftentimes drive the way that we look at it. So how are we emotionally framing this? If we have an emotional interpretation that says, oh my goodness, we're all going to die. This is going to kill us all. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Oh my goodness. That type of emotional framing is only going to do what? 
accelerate our stress and start that negative stress response that we talked about earlier. So we have to change the way we feel about it. Hey, science is doing as much as they can in healthcare to get in front of this, this pandemic. We're going to get this, you know, it's not going to be too much longer before I can be worshiping with my, with my church friends and family. You know what? Um, every day, um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some positive reinforcements that how blessed I am, even in the middle of a pandemic, or even in the middle of me being alone. We have to emotionally change how we feel about this. Because remember, as the mind goes, the body follows. And so if we start down a negative emotional loop, our body is going to follow down there. So we don't have the ability to change the situation, but how we interpret or feel about it, we have control. So that's another way that we can get control, control of our emotions and emotionally interpret the situation. So thoughts, awareness, and positive thinking, like I said, our negative thinking, like I said before, contributes to our stress levels. So get the negativity out there. Be aware of our thoughts. We don't want to bring all that negativity in there. And if somebody wants to confront you with negativity, it's your job to reframe it in a positive way. Give and receive positive affirmations. Give and receive positive affirmations. Because you have control of that, and trust me, you start to, as you perceive it, you will believe it, and it will manifest in physically as well. So you can start to break the bonds of the negativity that social isolation brings if you can create and own your thoughts. You have to rebuild your, resil your resilience. So resilience is your ability to, to truly get your arms around and to be able to bounce back when we're facing adversity, trauma, tragedy, or, th or threats of any sort. So you have to embrace your healthy thoughts, build up your connection, and you have to foster wellness. Resiliency is the key. So research has been done all around the country on the most successful dangers, both mentally and physically, people who live to be over 100 that have a great quality of life. Resilience is one of the top three correlates for people who live well. So this is a time that we need to build resilience and be around positive people too. That's the other trick. Those who we do have contact with, make sure they're positive contacts. Foster that type of wellness. You can't control the situation. But you need to think clearly how to understand to understand how to navigate it. That's what's under your control. You can't control that, but emotionally navigate it well and spread that to others the best that you can. That's what you need to be beginning to put into play in an emotional oriented approach. And then after that, the emotional, we have um ways of managing our anxious thoughts. Uh, avoid overgeneralizing. Um, be rooted in the truth and not lies. Don't get caught up in the emotion of a lot of uh, the hysteria that you sometimes will see on TV. Um, you know, control what you can and, and be able to, to, to see a counselor or a therapist if you're having difficulty with the emotional aspect. So look to, to really get a hold of that. And now the acceptance oriented is we don't have the ability to change the situation nor the emotional control. So what we have to do for the acceptance is live in the moment. Focus on each day, not the future. So if you start, for some people, if you start to focus on, oh, we're going to get back to normal in maybe another six months by the time you know, we reach herd immunity, so stay isolated and so on and so forth and blah, blah, blah. Ah, that's overwhelming to a lot of people for another six months. Your job for acceptance oriented is really the serenity prayer. You know, uh, God grant you what you need for today um, and focus on each day because you can't control the future. So focusing on each day allows you to say, okay, Today is a blessing. I'm going to eat well today. I'm going to move my body today. 
I'm going to get fresh air today. I'm going to do that. You focus on the day and you win the day. When you win the day, that's a big check mark. And then when tomorrow comes, what do you focus on? Winning tomorrow. You can't focus on, on two months from now, four months from now, six months from now, because that's where the stress level starts to raise because those are things that are out of your control. So you have to focus on today. And acceptance says, this is my, this is where I am today, and I'm going to win today. That's right. So that's a great strategy for those who who have difficulty um, relating to the others. It's just today, it's about today. God give me the strength for today. That's where you need to focus on acceptance. So those are the three response managers that we have when we're isolated. Action, emotional, or acceptance. And sometimes a plan with the three is there for you. And that's what you have as a tool to help you cope with isolation. So moving, moving on um, past the response benefit, we know that caregiver isolation is real. People that who have been caring for folks during this, this period of time. And caregivers get burnt out and stressed out because not only do they have to care for somebody who needs care, they're not getting care for themselves and they're isolated as well. So they have to be able to understand what we just talked about, those three responses, but also learn about themselves and take breaks and, and learn how to relax and use positive healing for themselves, prayer, meditation, guided, guided imagery, mindfulness, so that they can get through. Because oftentimes, they're battling for a couple people, for the person they're caring for and themselves. And so taking on that kind of burden sometimes is really stressful for folks. So if you're a caregiver, give yourself grace and give yourself breaks and learn relaxation techniques. Those are the ones some of the only things that is going to be able to manage your stress over a period of time. So really take care of yourself in that continuum. So let's think about this. In the terms of social isolation, how do we make every contact count? How do we do that? How do we do a better job of looking after our health and well-being in general? Of our families, our colleagues, and ourselves. How, how do we how do we do a better job of that? You know, how do we seek prevention in difficult times so that we don't get to a point where we're anxious, depressed, and stressed out? How do we ensure that there's enough community access to fulfill, you know, so that people can live their full potential? How do we give the gift of time when people are isolated? And how do we combat loneliness and social isolation? Those are things that we need to always have in front of center because it's happening all around us, specifically now. So one of the key things we have to do is to find purpose. Find something that adds to your purpose in your life, meaning that we know that we are created with purpose and passion. And when we don't have purpose and passion, that's when all the negative effects start to happen. So we're created to be in community. So that's the first thing. So purpose and passion is oftentimes found in a community setting. What can we do collectively? How can we engage each other? How can we lift each other up? So finding purpose is really important. And finding purpose can be simply um, saying that I'm going to engage, you know, a couple people a day, a couple people a day. I'm going to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. But ways to find purpose in your life. So we know that there's current research out there that tells us or leads us on a roadmap that allows us to live better even when we're socially isolated. Let's find out what research tells us. Research tells us that our senses lead the way. That we were created with our senses that help us break the bonds of isolation. Huh. So let's look to our senses and see what our senses have to say to be able to combat social isolation. 
what does research tell us about our senses? So our first sense um, is the sense of touch. So when we use touch, whether it is uh, a religious symbol, uh, doing a genuflect or, or prayer hands or rosary or something like that, using touch, it stimulates a part of our brain that breaks loneliness. It goes into a different place. And water, having water on our skin, this is why it's important to, to, to shower or bathe every day because there is no substitution on calming the body than water. And this is why we're always drawn to the ocean or the lake and, and things along those lines. So making sure that we have water on our skin every day, it changes our brain and the way that we perceive things. Sunlight as well. You know, research tells us that SA or seasonal affective disorder happens to a lot of people in the north, in the north, in the northwest, excuse me, the northeast as well, the Midwest, when they go through winter without seeing the sun for large periods of time, that they become depressed and, and, and anxious and things along those lines. We know that sunlight is responsible for creating vitamin D in our bodies. And when we're socially isolated and locked in, we don't get any sunlight. So one of the things, the feeling of sunlight on our skin has medical and psychological benefits to us, and it breaks the bonds of isolation. So we need water on our skin every day. We need sunlight. We need to be able to get the sun's rays in us. We need to exercise, even if we're isolated. There's things like we can do solo. There's, there's cheer yoga, tai chi. There's even just some simple calisthenics. There's, there's exercise programs on TV to engage our bodies. Our physicality during isolation is really important because to stay sedentary is really robbing our body of what it needs to, to perfuse the brain and the body in terms of nutrients and oxygenation in the body. So we have to move our body even during isolation. So touch, everything from religious symbols, uh, water, sunlight, exercise are all important to break the bonds of the negative aspects of social isolation. So the sense of touch is very important. The next sense we're going to talk about is the sense of taste. We need to engage in healthy, favorite comfort foods. Oftentimes, a negative happens, meaning that we find ourselves overeating unhealthy comfort food, which is, I'm going to eat a pint of ice cream because it makes me feel good. Um, I'm going to eat a, a tray of cookies because it makes me feel good. I'm going to eat a whole pot of mac and cheese because it makes me feel good. That's the opposite of what you should be doing. You should be eating your favorite healthy foods. So cook up a mess of greens and 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 really eat some great healthy foods, healthy desserts, your favorite healthy beverages, smoothies, and things along those lines. Here's what happens in the brain. The anticipation and joy that comes through eating your favorite healthy foods actually works in the brain to break the grip of isolation. We start to look forward to, oh my goodness, in the morning time, we're going to have my favorite smoothies with blueberries and bananas and all that stuff. And it creates excitement and breaks the bonds of stress. For lunch, you say, you know what? I'm going to have my favorite sandwich, my favorite salad for lunch. And you can mix it up all week long to have all of these interesting things that you can eat that you enjoy because we know our body goes into a positive emotive, emotive state when we eat food that we enjoy. So taste breaks the bonds of isolation. So eating good, healthy food is a positive for us while we're isolated. So that's a big thing to remember. Good, healthy food breaks the bonds, the negative bonds of social isolation. And then we have sight. We want to engage our sight. So we want to get on FaceTime, Zoom, Skype, do drive-by visits. We want to send cards so people can see what's written down and, and pictures, want to exchange pictures to email or whatever the case may be text pictures, whatever we can do, we want to engage our sight because that lightens and brightens up our day. 
So sight is a very important sense to engage during isolation. We want to be able to see the people we love on a regular basis. So make regular appointments to technology to be able to do that. I used to be with you guys in person at the NLK Center on a regular basis. Well, we're doing it this way now. Uh, we're doing it remotely. So you still get to see me, you know, I sense your presence there, but we're still connecting. And it's important that we connect in this capacity rather than being isolated with no connection at all. So sight is really important, really important to the brain that was positive reinforcement from sight. <laughs> and then of course we have smell. Smell is the highest sense that's linked to memory. Yeah. As we smell certain things, it changes everything. Our mood, it changes the course of a day, our behavior. So essential oils of just smelling um, uh, any types of of blue fragrances or flowers or things like that change everything. So if you want to invest in some uh, fragrance or essential oils, we know lavender is used to reduce stress and sandalwood and calms the nerves. Bergamot uh, reduces anxiety and so does rose and chamomile improves the mood and it makes us all relaxed. And lemon digestion mood and headaches are are part and parcel of some of the things that that does. And so creating these positive smells, creating these positive smells which then change our brain chemistry and breaks the bonds of isolation as well. And we have another sense that we're going to talk about, the sense of sound, music therapy, listening to the soundtrack of your life or your favorite songs brings the world into a different focus. You're not concentrating on the stressful aspects. You're actually transported to a different time when that music lifted you up. Whether it be a, a spiritual or a hymn or some R and B or or some Motown or or some country music or whatever it is that starts to lift you up. And then a sense of sound by just hearing someone else's voice, a phone call. That can do wonders for people. There was some research done at the beginning of the pandemic, um, done by the Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, which showed that people who were in assisted livings and memory cares, when they got a 30 minute phone call a week from somebody who cared about them, it changed everything. Their stress levels and their levels of isolation decreased. One, because during the call, they were able to express themselves and, and so on and so forth. And there was a positive bounce for days later. And then after that, later on in the week, we saw this positive bounce that you were anticipating already when you were going to get your next call. And so there's positivity that comes from anticipating something good. So even just getting simple calls from people changes everything in terms of our ability not to be isolated. So all of our senses come into play. They're really important for us to combat isolation. So in closing, our job is to find our path. One, we have to help others who are isolated by all the strategies that we talked about. And two, seeking the health, help and, and turning to some of these strategies if you yourself are isolated. Again, we were created to be in community. And this community setting, this, this aspect of community, is really important for us to get through this last part of, of what isolates us. And even after this pandemic happens, many of us are still going to be isolated by some of the factors that I talked about earlier in the talk. It could be illness, it could be, it could be lack of mobility, lack of transportation, poverty, loss of the spouse, or family dynamics. Yeah present this whole notion of being isolated. So it's something that we have to keep in the forefront of our mind even after we come out of the pandemic. So let's continue to serve others and seek the help for ourselves in terms of social isolation. So that is the end of our presentation for today.
And I'm going to turn it over to, to Karen because we don't have the capability right now to do a question and answer on our, on our, um, our format today. So I'm going to turn it over back over to Karen to close, to close off. So thank you very much. It's been my pleasure being here with you on behalf of the Cleveland Clinic through Google Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas and the Metric Care Education. Myself, I wish you um, a great, great day and look forward to um, seeing you next month. And I'm going to turn it over to Karen right now. Thank you so much, Brian, for that fantastic information. I hope that everybody enjoyed that presentation this morning. Um, I am going to share a quick screen with you um, to give you some information about our next lecture. So bear with me while we make that happen. And we'll get that up and running here in just a second. Okay, hopefully everybody's got that up there on their screen. Um, this Our next lecture is going to be on May 2nd at 10.30. As I mentioned previously, we'll be on the first Monday of every month at 10.30 with a new topic as we journey through this educational series. We're going to be talking about our DNA and our genes, epigenetics, fantastic topic, and definitely a topic for everybody to be involved in to understand how we are moving forward through this journey called life. We also would like to give you the opportunity to sign up for a memory screening. We're doing virtual memory screenings in cooperation with the Cleveland Clinic. If you are interested in participating that that is a free service, we invite you to contact us, give us your information, and we'll reach out to you and get you slotted into a time frame that works for you in order to do a virtual memory screening. So you can contact us at the email address provided, Karen at DementiaCareEducation.com. You can check in with your host at the MLK Center if you have questions on that or if you're looking to get information to us and they will be sure and, and provide us with those of you who would like to take part in that memory screening um, event or events. Um, our contact information for us, for those of you with a notepad in front of you, you can take that down and reach us at Info at Dementia Care Education. For general questions, we do. We are aware that we're at the MLK Center today, and although I misspoke in the beginning thinking you could avail of the Q&A, we are open to your questions. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time at info at DementiaCareEducation.com. We invite you to join the conversation during this series. We're on social media and we try to keep you updated on what we have going on in order to um, be able to keep you in the loop. We are going to be repeating this social isolation, so if you really enjoyed today's lecture and you'd like to invite a friend to join us again, you can check it out on our website as this does repeat at different times in our normal series. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see our really exciting new logo for our Brain Health 365. We are dropping podcasts on a bi-weekly basis that runs simultaneously with the information you're receiving at the MLK Center. We'll be getting that information to them so that you can join our conversations with experts in the field that will be addressing the same topics that we address during our lectures. Okay, so I would like to again thank our hosts for today. Thank you all for joining us. We enjoyed our spending our morning together and look forward to the next time. Take care and have a great rest of your week. Thank you, Karen and Brian. We appreciate you and we applaud you and we thank you for the information and we'll make sure that it's also on our Facebook page under Economic Opportunity Board uh, recording and also we're recording it here. So if you want to hear this again, feel free to either contact uh, or look it up on their social media or you can look it up on ours. It's up to you. Anyway, well, thank you. We appreciate you and have a great day. It's always a great day at MLK. I was just reminded to say that. <laughs> All right, take care now. Until next time.